56 second, 50 second. Gee, I just promoted us. We all got older real fast. Yeah. 52nd season of the Utah Shakespeare Festival. Um, I was just talking to David, the uh, assistant here, who is David, where are you? He's a graduate <laughs> student at Southern Utah University in the Arts Administration program. He hails from Tampa, Florida, and um, he is the reason why all this works, and he fixes things when it does doesn't work as in yesterday, so I wanted to acknowledge David this morning. And we were just talking about how those of you who've been here for several seasons, you usually hear the chimes, and the chimes aren't chiming, and we don't know why, but we're going to. You don't know, do you, why the chimes aren't chiming? Yeah, the clock. <laughs> Okay, we could get Prospero or perhaps Ariel to help you. Somebody wake Quasimodo up. Yes, right. <laughs> anyway, uh, my name is Nancy Mielich. I'm literary seminar director here at the festival, beginning my 10th season this year. And I'm uh, so pleased to have B.J. Jones with us this morning, the director of last night's production of The Tempest. It is the ninth time this festival has presented The Tempest. B.J. is the artistic director of Northlight Theater in Skokie, Illinois. I believe it's your 15th season as artistic director at that theater. Uh, I had the pleasure of being there in April to see the festival in a joint production with B.J.'s Theater of Stones in His Pockets with Brian Vaughn and David Ivers that had a six-week run at your theater, yes, at the Northlight. B.J. has previously directed here, uh, he directed Twelfth Night in 2007 and Much Ado in 2010 here and now The Tempest. So um, is there anyone here this morning for the very first time to a literary seminar at the Utah Shakespeare Festival? Yes, welcome. Very good. Okay, so what we like to do here is to get a conversation going with the director. The directors are here just through the opening of their shows and they graciously agree to come be with us in the morning. Uh, BJ, unfortunately, or fortunately for all of you, this is the only literary seminar he will be able to attend because he's a very busy man and has to go off to all of his other projects and will be leaving us very soon. So he did say he could come this morning and we're pleased that he's here. Um, we have microphones that we will send out. Thank you. We have one microphone that we will send out. So yesterday I gave huge applause to this group because they behaved so well. <laughs> we'll fix that. <laughs> they, they offered insightful comments and questions. And if you can, when you have the microphone, if, well, let me, f let me phrase it this way. Uh, occasionally in my years of being here, I've had people come up to me after these, uh, during the break and say, you didn't call on me, you didn't call on me. Well, I we, we try and see where the questions are, but if you can raise your hand or you could even stand up so that the person who has the mic can pass it on to you. And if you can be a little bit mindful of the time element here and not hang on to the mic too long, um, no filibustering allowed at the literary seminar. Anyway, um, so let's begin. And I, I think actually I would like to do something a little different this morning. And since BJ is only going to be here for one hour this season at the in the Grove, I would like you maybe to just start off with how you entered the play. I don't believe you've ever directed The Tempest before. And it's <laughs> such a huge undertaking. And I wondered if you would mind talking just a moment about how you, what your concept was, uh, did it change from when you first knew you were going to direct to what we saw last night? Um, thank you, Nancy. Doesn't she do a great job? <laughs> I love doing these, I have to say, because the, uh, look at that beautiful butterfly. The, I, I, I always feel uh, that we, as much contact as we can possibly have with the audience, in conversation. Some of you may have not seen the show yet. Some of you uh, may may have seen it. 
oh, she wants the microphone already, uh, may see it uh, on Friday. It's always great to be in conversation with the audience so that uh, w we, can, we can understand uh, each other's positions and uh, both aesthetic and uh, personal. My work as I get older as a director, it becomes increasingly personal. It was always that way as an actor. You use yourself and your instrument, your voice, your intelligence, your wit, uh, your body to communicate with an audience and you use it through uh, whatever instincts that, that you've been given. As a director, uh, I, I used to just take on the work and uh, put it up in the way that I perceived the author's intent, but more and more it's becoming uh, important for me to f make it flow through who I am. And at 62 years old, I identify strongly with Prospero and his journey and where he's going. But the Prospero of Shakespeare's day is an entirely different Prospero than the one that's playing in the Adams now. Henry Warnitz is even younger than I am. <laughs> if you consider 60s young, uh, which I do. It's the new 30. <laughs> there you go. And that's who's sitting in the seats. And you're here because you are, many of you are retired, but you didn't retire from something. You're retiring to something, a quality of life, a different choice, a new adventure, a new contribution to to your community and society. And that's the way I feel. And I think that's what Prospero is doing. So my entry point was looking through the very vital person that obviously Henry Warnitz is. And, and knowing that uh, he has orchestrated this possibility, this event, uh, so that he could get Miranda uh, not just himself, but Miranda back to uh, Milan. And now she's to become the queen of Naples. And he has his dukedom back. But his brother Antonio is still hanging around and has not apologized. Did you notice that? So the last shot is him looking at his brother and going, I still got work to do. So for me, it's retiring to something, a vital life an active life. He may say every third thought will be of my death, but that's only a third. Two-thirds is living. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, he's also, and then, Nancy, may I continue? Um, <coughs> then there is, uh, w you know, uh, when Nancy asked, did it evolve? Uh, what I also realized once we got into rehearsal is that it's not just the corporal that this play is about. For me, it's more about the spiritual. There is the underlying theme of forgiveness and, uh, and uh, uh, abjuring uh, uh, vengeance. But it's also about uh, an understanding of what, what the human experience is and what the spiritual experience is. When he looks at Ariel for the last time, he you know, he's wondering what it's like to be in the spirit world. If every third thought is his death, that's where he's going. That's where we're all going. What is that? And Ariel asks the same question of him, and we've heightened that. We've tweaked that in this production because I discovered that, I, you know, first of all, I asked for Ariel to be a woman. It's usually a man, as you know. For, for, for a very different purpose, I, 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 I felt that a woman... Well, I thought there could, do you love me, Master, she says. And I felt there could be some form of electricity there. And as rehearsal went on, I realized it's not a, it's not a human love. It's not the kind of love that we understand. It's a more spiritual love. And that really deepens the play for me in a very important way because she wants to know what it's like to love within a human context. Does that make sense? And so, and so the two of them are eyeing each other in important intellectual uh, ways, I think, because they're both uh, intellects, keen intellects. He spent his life studying, and uh, it's how he lost his kingdom. 
So that examination of what the spiritual world is and her examination, her curious examination, because really the, the only two human beings she's probably ever seen are Miranda and Prospero, and here's all these other characters that show up that she's just crashed on the ship. I mean, she's, she's been uh, out and about. He sent her on errands to the Bermoofies, as they say. But really, at close proximity, human behavior is curious to her. And love is an uh, intellectual concept. It's she doesn't quite get it, and she wants to get it. Because she doesn't, she could be manipulated by him. As, you know, he, she could be clasped into a, a pine tree again. But really, she has options, I think. And a, a, at least intellectually, she's free in her mind. And uh, so that sort of fed it. Uh, that sort of fed all of the choices we made around er, around Ariel as we were in rehearsal. I'm babbling on. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's good. And you know, as you were talking, I was thinking, as Ariel hasn't seen too many humans, Miranda has not, nor Caliban. So we have these three different characters that Shakespeare has given us different viewpoints with each of them to enter that human world. And then there's Prospero, who knows the human world, who goes to the magic and spiritual world. So it's fascinating. Yeah, Caliban's like the most unique character in Shakespeare. It's tr truly an interesting character. And I, I don't know that dramatic literature has one as unique as Caliban, but uh, there, you know, there was Pac. But uh, when, we, when we talked, uh, uh, Melinda Parrott, who plays Ariel, whom she's fantastic, and <coughs> she, she and I talked about uh, Ariel uh, quite a bit, and who Ariel was, and and her her feelings for Prospero, and so forth. And I, but Caliban is is, you know, I, I referred to uh, Ariel as Puck grown up. It's not impish, really. It's uh, it's a much more mature. Uh, spirit, and uh, and that's what she's doing. You didn't know her thumbs light up. <laughs> you like that? Yeah. Uh, I have a comment and then a question. First of all, thank you for making me very seasick. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Read so it. glad to hear that because you know that could be like, you know, the storm could be kind of. Cheesy. The setting up, though, just yeah. We really, uh, at least I did. I was going, yeah. oh my god. It could be really cheesy, you know. The actors all just go, uh, you know, it looks like, it looks like William Shatner on the deck of the Star <laughs> Trek of the Enterprise. You know, so everybody sort of, you know. Oh, I think it works. <coughs> it's hard. But, but the question is, then when the storm came and, and there was such a wash of sound that you really lose the text. I mean, you, you just do. There's so much going on there. Was that intentional? No, actually. Uh, I have done two solid rehearsals of the storm scene in which we didn't use the sound at all, so that Jack Greenman, who's our voice and diction guy, our verse nurse, as we call him, <laughs> could uh, make sure that it's clear, and I, I, I'm sure it's hard, but the actors, I just say, stand, stand face out and yell it, because you gotta hear. There isn't a whole lot that, I mean, you could lose it and not, lose the journey, uh, the, the fear is greater. The fact, the fact of the fear is greater in what's happening, so that you get that they're crashing. And, uh, but part of, the part of the trick of the storm for us is I've got a lot of gimmicks going on. I, don't, I mean, you know, it took a, we had to rehearse it a lot. So it isn't just people staggering around, around like they've had one too many. There's, you know, I added the shadow puppet so that you're looking at that. I added Ariel being there. I've got Henry as Prospero up in the balcony uh, for the kids. The 60 kids <laughs> were up there last night. Uh, I've got the girls working the sails, and then they twirl around. i got the guy sliding down the rope. and So there's a lot going on in the hopes, this is a directorial trick, in the hopes that you won't get too, oh, this is fake. You know, because you, you've because you've got a lot of stuff to watch, so we have a lot of bells and whistles. It, 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 we had to rehearse this over and over and over again, because it's so. And then, just this last week, I added the little pre-show. 
So the the little bit, you know, there's a line. <laughs> yeah, that's in a week. This cast is fast. And there's a line in the play where he says, we're undone by drunkards. And I'm like, well, n- why does he say that? There's no drinking. So then I had the I had the, <laughs> the bosun and uh, the sailor who was sh- sailing the ship sharing a nip and getting caught by the master. So we've got a little story going on in that, too, if you bother to watch or if you're reading your program, you don't know. You know what I mean. But we just added that. And that's like a... That's like an eight-minute scene with no lines. So this cast, I'm telling you, this company is, you throw them something, and they just put it, put the bit in their mouth and run with it. It's great. Um, and I love the shadow puppet for, this, for the ship. And I swear I saw the wave coming from everybody <laughs> watching, and I, ke- I kind of expected to see the wave on the shadow puppet. That's great. That was, that was wonderful. I mean, I, I could tell there was a, a huge rogue wave coming. Yeah, that's great. Well, y- rogue wave, I love that. Why didn't I use that? But I love it when the boat goes up like this. Because if you look over at Ariel, she's got a ship, too. Did you see that? And she's got a... C- and then she breaks it apart. <laughs> she got that. I'm telling you, we c- we're spinning plates as fast as we can. Interestingly enough, the storm I have read may ha- Shakespeare may have pulled the description of the storm itself from a real life event that's tied to the lost colony at Roanoke. Had had you heard that part? Yes. Uh, G- John White, who was the d- uh, the ship captain, had tried to go back to England to get aid for the lost colony at Roanoke. And that was about the time the Spanish Armada uh, attacked. So he took them three years to get <laughs> get back to Roanoke. But in the meantime, they were uh, experiencing a, a huge, terrible storm that threw them ashore. And probably he wrote about it. He was a contemporary of Shakespeare, had known associates that were contemporary of Shakespeare. So his his description of the tempest that really shipwrecked him may have been quite real in Shakespeare's Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the back story that we have from that is that the governor of Virginia, mm. there was a governor coming over from Virginia. They went through uh, Bermuda, mm. and uh, they got hit by a storm near Bermuda, and uh, the governor's ship went down. Everybody else proceeded to Virginia. The other ships proceeded to Virginia, but they had lost him. And it was a full year. They rebuilt the ship in Bermuda. I guess they fixed it. And then all of a sudden, a year later, they sailed into Virginia. And they were like, whoa, you're alive. So you're absolutely right. The source material on this came from a A a hot topic of the day. So it's a very accurate storm. I was interested in your mentioning William Shatner um, (laughs) and all the (laughs) all the buzz and various interviews lately about um, the Star Trek movie. Um, Something I picked up, which I had not in the the Next Generation, was how the whole um, thrust of the Star Trek was to expose what it is to be human as opposed to be data or or something. And so I thought that when you were talking about uh, Ariel and maybe even Caliban trying to understand, like like Data did, uh, loving or humor or <laughs> something like that, and um, the their their yearning to understand and to be human and find um, what that amazing spiritual uh, love uh, dimension is. So there's a little precursor to Star Trek in here. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, uh, I have never seen Star Trek. <laughs> I've never, <laughs> no, no, no. But I'm not a Trekkie at all, so um, I don't quite, but you can see how Star Trek, Star Trek couldn't exist if there wasn't a Tempest, in my opinion. Um, I had a comment about Ariel, who was by far my favorite favorite in this particular production. Um, it seems to me that she turns um, Henry, Harry uh, Prospero, Prospero around 
When she says, well, I no, would were I human. Say, yeah, I would if I were human. You're right. She yeah. does. And in that moment, he's, oh, I need to forgive them. I think he has been willing to learn from that spirit. All his life. He is a learner. Uh, he loves to learn. But to learn that from someone that you dominate, uh, to show that enormous generosity of spirit <laughs> and, and to understand the purity of that spiritual gesture is the whole play spins on that moment, in my opinion. And, uh, and I think they do it beautifully. I think those two work together so well. I can't even tell you. Yeah. And I, yeah. It's why I have them go out together uh, at the <laughs> curtain call, you know. Um, uh, and we'll fix the curtain call, I promise. It's, uh, you know, I o we only ran it once. There's so preciously, you know, there d we do s six shows in six days at this theater. And there is so much, you, you only have so much time. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an amazing reality of, you want to talk backstage? It's an amazing reality of this place. I was trying to figure it out. I think we only have 96 hours of rehearsal, but I've been here two months. But we only have 96 hours of actual allowable, shall we say, rehearsal uh, per show. And I have more rehearsal at Northlight when I put up a play, even a new play. Uh, I, I have, uh, because I have more than 96 hours and I have eight previews, we have two previews. It only speaks to the quality of the talent, the cast, how extraordinary they are in terms of their ability. Because everybody's doing two and three roles. There are guys who are understudying as well. Most folks are understudying. So the enormity of the task and how they shoulder it with bonhomie and, uh, and uh, they use all of their skills and their talents, it's amazing. And you know, uh, Ariel, well you talked about her being your favorite, Ariel, but you know, she's doing uh, Anything Goes t today. In fact, they're in rehearsal right now. I'm not kidding. And they'll be, uh, uh, they'll go, th what, three or four hours this morning, and then they're doing it at two o'clock in the afternoon, and she's playing the lead. Yeah, she's, she's, yeah, she's amazing. So um, when you were talking just now about asking the audience here if they wanted to know a little back backstage story. Last night you took notes, and you told me this morning you had notes, uh, and you just referenced how you're going to uh, do a little bit different with curtain call. Was there anything you saw last night that th that leapt out at you because of the audience response to it that yeah. you might that you gave a note yeah, to them? Yeah, now th this is strange, but <coughs> I think that I think the storm scene is pretty great, and thank you. But see. Your your response to it right now didn't happen last night, and so I'm thinking, hmm, I think I'm killing potential appreciation on the part of the audience for the for the skill set. So um, there was a speech that Brian Humphreys, who plays Gonzalo, has, and as the as the sail comes down, I thought it was going to take a lot longer to wipe the stage than it did. And that sail comes down so quickly and gets, mm -hmm. it's like we turned on a vacuum cleaner and yeah, it sucks yeah. right down. But w I didn't know what the material was going to be, so I didn't know. So I have, and this is in the text, he's got this fairly long, probably six line speech, which ends with, I would fain die a dry death. Say that three times fast. <laughs> and um, so I think, wait a minute, hold on. This is what we're doing on, on Friday. Hold on. So what I think I'm going to do is trim that so that, because I think we're sitting there watching him, listening to that speech. He now says, Now would I give a thousand furlongs of sea for an acre of barren ground, long heath, brown furs, anything. The will's above be done, but I would fain die a dry death. And I think I'm going to cut the first part of it and just go to... The wheels above be done, but I would fain die a dry death and get him out. And he, that'll happen as the sheet comes down. So, and then all of a sudden it's father, father, and she runs on stage. So there'll be room for you if you want to uh, contribute. Um, 
to do that. But I think I what I've done is I, I think I've tripped up my own. You know, uh, uh, may I say, uh, uh, I, I love all the lines. <laughs> <laughs> but as I say, you know, we cut this. It's been cut. And um, partially for time and uh, uh, partially because there's a lot of uh, archaic references that confound an audience. Like there's a whole bunch of stuff in uh, uh, this scene with uh, Antonio Sebastian, Alonzo, Gonzalo. Uh, we called them the Donner Party. <laughs> 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 and uh, no, that's part, it's witty, uh, from, and I'm not, I stole that from somebody, but it, uh, there, there, it's witty uh, uh, from two standpoints, one of which is it, it, it's like they're roaming around and stranded and stuff. And the other one is, it's, it's the part of the play that eats the play. Because, you know, The Tempest, you get, f you get quite inured to the eye candy of The Tempest. You know, you've got spirits, you've got this guy coming out of a rock, you've got, it's all sorts. And then these, uh, uh, about uh, 45 minutes into the play, these guys come out and talk about politics. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's all of a sudden it's King John for 10 minutes, and, and they're going to kill the king. And you're like, what? Who are these guys? <laughs> Let's get back to the girl in blue. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So all of a sudden, the Donner Party eats, eats the play. And, and, and if you look at this, the way it's structured, <coughs> now remember, he had five acts. We have two. Well, I mean, we sort of clumped them together. But that first act is all set up. It's all exposition. And it pays off in the second, right? So that's yet another, here, here's some more things to think about while you're, and then we introduce two brand new characters that you never saw before. They weren't on the ship, and I purposefully didn't put them on the ship because I wanted to be a little surprised. I could have had them staggering around with oh, William Shatner and, uh, in the yeah. front, <laughs> but I didn't. And, uh, so, ooh, weren't we? Uh, so anyway, um, those guys all of a sudden show up, at least they're funny at the end of the act, right? And then I added that little coda that's not in the play where you see all the other characters so you remember what the plots are. Do you know what I'm talking about? So the boys go out singing the new Top 40 hit in Cedar City, Ban Ban Caliban. <laughs> the boys go out, and then you see the Donner Party come on, and then you see the lovers because, you know, uh, Prospero has to keep them at bay lest something happen too soon. And uh, and we leave you on that sort of tableau. That's really not in the play. I just added it. It sounds like I added a lot of stuff. I didn't really. Well, kudos to your production. It is absolutely great. Thanks. I've seen many tempests, and um, also it's remarkable what you did uh, for Ariel, because I I've never seen her in the productions I've seen have so much prominence. And the costuming was great for that, too. Usually I see her in a sheet or something, a white sheet or something white. And so I love that. It brought a, a whole lot of, um, you know, decor <laughs> to the stage. And I think uh, Shakespeare had an intention for the facility of storms since at least five productions, of uh, plays, he wrote, rather, uh, engage a storm scene or a shipwreck, as in uh, Othello, Twelfth Night, rather, has a shipwreck, and Othello has a storm. So do you have any idea why he liked to depart from that kind of uh, scene? <laughs> well, it's, it's a great way to start a, you know, it's tragedy. And it, it, it's a great way to start a, it kicks off, it really r sends a play off with some rocket fuel. And so much of the, you know, remember, uh, England was England and Spain were ruling the seas at this time, so everyone I'm sure was obsessed with the New World, and with uh, importing and exporting and the explore. What are those people like? It's part of the great mystery. It's it, you know, it's like NASA. <laughs> you know, what's up there? What's out there? Because no one knew. So I, I'm sure that's probably a. It's a great way to kick off the play. You know. 
And I read that uh, thunder was done with cannons and cannonballs. What did you use? <laughs> Joe Payne, the guy who wrote the music. The music's fantastic, and he's he he's got great stuff going. I just and you you can ask him for a little something. He he's got all sorts of tricks in his bag. Front row down here. Sorry. They also used to use thunder sheets, you know, which is sort of like your air conditioning material or your <laughs> the air conditioning ducts that you rattle. I, I was just wondering the the basis for the music. Um, it, I mean, it sounds a little Celtic, but I was just wondering. Um, I gave Joe, before we had our February meetings here, like in November, an album of a group called Fever Ray. They are Nordic, actually. But we wanted a combination of, I w I w I w because we were setting it in the Caribbean, I wanted I wanted it to have that kind of island feel, and uh, I kind of liked the way that music fit into Ban Ban Caliban. <laughs> I sang Ban Ban <laughs> Caliban to Joe on the phone. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, right? No. And so he went and transcribed it, and then we sort of reworked it, and then we're teaching the boys a little dance, which is based on... <laughs> Will Kemp, who used to be um, Shakespeare's comic until they had a falling out, created differences, as we call it now, used to have a little dance that he did. There's a famous uh, woodblock of Will Kemp dancing his jig because that was his routine. He did it at the end of shows. He, uh, he did a jig, and he became known for that. And then he went off and uh, joined other companies when he had a falling out with Shakespeare. So... I took that as an inspiration for the jigs that the boys do at the end of the first act. I said, give me, s give me some Will Kemp. Could you sing Bam Bam Caliban that you sang to Joe Payne for us? <laughs> well, because I, <laughs> I cut it, you know, I, I, I just sort of, I just, I don't need, I, I, I don't know the li lyrics. <laughs> nah, y yeah, but it's, yeah. it's more like, um, yeah, here it is. No more dams I'll make for fish, nor fetch and firing at requiring, nor scrape, tr uh, nor scrape trenchering, nor wash dish. Ban, ban, Caliban. Ban, ban, Caliban has a new master. Get a new man. And then I, I just, then I started a, a round. And then I said, then the boys sing it and answer it. Then there, there's a call and response between the boys. That's not in the script. So I, I just, and yeah, and then, then I was hoping that We'll see how it goes. Once I get more at ease with it, then... Because Rick was trying to start... Rick, who plays Trinculo, was trying to start it last night. If if he gets the audience going with, yeah. that would be pretty funny. You know what? Here, here's how good these guys are. So yesterday afternoon, I say to Rick... Is this right? I said to Rick Pe Peoples, you know what? Y you know, you say, this is even... W this is after they've come out of the muck <laughs> and the mire. And I said, this is even worse. He says, this is even worse than my wetting. <laughs> but it so, sort of sounds like wedding, <laughs> which, uh, you know, I said, you got to hit that T. <laughs> well, then I went, wait a minute. We should sort of show and tell that. So I said, and he, he, uh, everybody's got handkerchiefs. Nobody's using them. That's one of the notes on Friday. <laughs> and I said, why don't you use the handkerchief? We'll drench it in water. And then you'll say it's even worse than my wedding. Then you can shoot it out like that and spray the front row. And then you can drench it so that we understand that it's wetting. And you saw the reaction it got yeah. from the, yeah. which was great. <laughs> I like me a little audience participation. <laughs> so he did that on the fly. We didn't rehearse that. He, was, he, was, he came out using it, r went from the storm. Uh, I mean, these guys are Great. You just give them a little firecracker and they go and shoot it off. It's just <laughs> wonderful. I was uh, amazed when Prospero was standing there in the storm. And it, it reminded me of, of Moses and <laughs> Ten Commandments. <laughs> was that on purpose? <laughs> he, well, no. <laughs> it's I don't know. I, I mean, Henry looks the way Henry looks and the robe and the... He's kind of Charlton Heston, I guess. I don't know. Kenny Rogers? <laughs> really? 
Listen, don't give me any more. I, I got one more <laughs> rehearsal. <laughs> I'm not adding anything else. I've been coming to the festival for about six years now, and I thoroughly enjoyed the Tempest. I've never seen it before. Closer, closer. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed the Tempest. Closer. I'm a, I'm a soft-spoken. Okay. I've been coming to the festival for about six years now, and I thoroughly enjoyed the Tempest, and I really enjoyed the musical aspect because that was something I'd not seen in the Shakespeare plays before, and I liked the dancing and the jigs because I found it inter very entertaining and lighthearted. That's great. You know, uh, so I did uh, Twelfth Night in 2007, and I did Much Ado in 2010. And <coughs> uh, I don't know... You may or may not have seen those productions, but I started them all off with music. Um, and I used some kids from the Green Show, and I I try and I try and get something uh, rather than start cold with language. I try and get the audience involved because really the truth is, you guys are just getting into your seats, and you've probably just had a meat pie or something, and you're <laughs> kind of and looking through your um, uh, program. Thank you. <sighs> wow, was that a senior moment? I'm in trouble. <laughs> 50 years in the theater and I can't remember program. And so I kind of try and do that to get you all on the same page before we start the language. Because that requires your attention. You know, Shakespeare requires that you listen and listen to the music of the language. So uh, a musical entry point is kind of good, ma'am. Where's it might oh comment here and then let's because we're yeah. we're discriminating against this side of the growth. So. I was just curious when Steph Stefano, I think Stefano. Stefan uh, fell off the stage on the right side. Yeah, he he's been doing that for months. So that was part that was uh, oh correct. Yeah, sure. He almost fell on my lap and I just was curious. <laughs> you got lucky. Big date night for you. <laughs> There's nothing like a guy filled with muck. So. Someone in the last couple of days said we should try to find out from you how you did some of the magic, like mainly the the opening of the book at the first, when the book opened, and also Prospero rising up to the floor in the lo lotus position. Okay, before you answer, let's take a vote to see how many want to know. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, dear. And how many don't want to know? Okay. All right, you we can leave. So the book, I got to tell you, so you know who they have working in the shop in the summer here? No, you There's a guy who's retired from NASA. Now, what are the odds? <laughs> right? He's from Houston. He comes up and he likes to work in the shop. And he's like, my, retiring to something. So he shows up. He doesn't need the money. He just loves this. So uh, we said, can you, well, it used to be there were two things. First, the book opens. And that's uh, wired to the back. I'm sure you're aware of that. I mean, it's really, it's like a, it's actually like a sort of like a mousetrap. So it comes up like that. And then there was another one where a book came out from the bookcase and presented itself to him. Sort of like Mickey Mouse and Sorcerer's <laughs> Apprentice. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, so you can go look on, how about this? On YouTube, how many, are you all functionally literate in... <laughs> Okay, so you go to YouTube <laughs> and Google Swami Levitation. <laughs> and you'll see how it's done. But I put that picture, because that's a beautiful image. I just love that image. And I'm telling you, you, all of you and the kids upstairs, everyone lurched forward when that happened. <laughs> which is kind of, you know, and I probably, I stole it from something else. I, but I, and I went to, I went, how do they do this? And I Googled, Googled it and got Swami Levitation. And uh, so go look at it because they do this on the streets of Mumbai, these swamis. It's, a, it's, I mean, it's centuries old. And it's, when you see it, you're like, well, that's as, I could have figured that out. <laughs> you're, it's so simple. Oh, uh, the ring is great. So, and I'll tell you this, because Rhett Guter, did, did you all see the ring? It's kind of hard to see. Oh, you did see it. Okay, great, great. All right, so he's got, they have matching rings. <coughs> and one of them is in uh, 
uh, Prospero's pocket. So he grabs it, and there is a, it's called a ring flight trick, and you can Google this too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so simple, it's stupid. So you know, remember the kid who used to run the AV closet at your high school? And you know how he had one of those things on his belt that, you know, that had, and, and it's got a little stretchy thing on it? That's all it is. So it's stuck up in his uh, vest, it goes down his arm, and it's attached to the ring, and the back of the ring is cut off. Okay? So it's like soldered to that. So all he does is uh, release, he's holding it tight, he releases it, and it zips up into his armpit. And Henry's already got his right hand, got the other one on his right hand. He's caught it like this, he turns his hand like that, and it's there. <laughs> it's called ring flight. Yeah. <laughs> Help yourself. Google. <laughs> you, anything you want, you can find on Google. Can, can you tell me a little bit more about the development of the character Caliban? Yeah, Caliban is... Um, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. It is the, you know, there is air, Ariel is air, and uh, Caliban is earth, and of the earth. And he is our baser nature. Um, and he's in transition. He's kind of rising up out of the quote-unquote primordial slime. And, uh, and he's very sensual. I, you know, she will give you brave brood. I would have peopled over this isle with Calibans, which is the animalistic nature. That is our purpose here on Earth. So, and, you know, they, I've heard people talk about it as a rape. And, uh, but he is an animal. And that is his purpose, to procreate. He would have peopled over this isle with uh, Caliban's and uh, so I find him kind of a tragic figure he's smarter than Stefano and Trinculo he manipulates them he you know hey you two he stops drinking they're drinking he doesn't do you notice that so we made that we wanted to make that very clear because he's if he can just get get these two drunks to do what he wants them to do you know those th all those plots like the Donner party there are all the wheels inside the super wheel of a plot. It's all about the trail, all of those. Do you know what I mean? Except for the romance, uh, Miranda and Ferdinand. So um, I find him kind of a tragic figure. And uh, that speech, th this aisle is full of noises. I, it's beautiful. Um, and I love the discovery of, I hope it did not upstage his speech, but I love her sort of uh, aerial in the inner above, echoing his sentiments while he does that speech. I just think that's beautiful because those are the two aspects of Prospero's character, the baser nature, the earthy, baser human nature, and then the spiritual nature. The other thing... Did I answer your question? With Caliban. So we see Prospero and we see his affection for Miranda, but also his control of Miranda. And we... Is we're sort of set up to think of, t to have an understanding of who C Prospero is. But then there is a dark side of Prospero, a very dark side. I mean, he's a slave owner of Caliban and of Ariel. And then seeing uh, Caliban's reaction to that, it is his island. These people have come, have invaded, and what does he want? What does he want? He wants revenge against Prospero. But at the end, Prospero forgives, sets free, but then we're left with Antonio, who still, he's still got to deal with him. You know, uh, there are a lot of productions, as you know, uh, of The Tempest, which focus on the colonial nature and the slave, the enslavement nature of the... But you know, one of the things about working in the Adams, we have a tradition here, and there's a certain period that you're, su that you're supposed to, uh, in terms of mission, keep the plays, usually through uh, 